Welcome everyone and thank you to those joining us live and those that would be listening in later after the recordings. You are being hosted today by the academic pharmacy section and the community pharmacy section. Really a, pl a practical implementation of the one foot concept that our president always talks about. I would also like to warmly welcome our guest today whom I will introduce as we go along. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Sham Mudli, and I will be your moderator for the session. I'm a community pharmacist in South Africa, a member of the FIP CPS executive. Um, as you can see, I also am the vice chair of the Independent Community Pharmacy Association in South Africa, and I sit on the National Executive of the Pharmaceutical Society. I assure you of an amazing lineup of experts in the field, bringing a true mix of the science of sports medicine, its practical applications at the highest level of Olympic status, and the day-to-day -day implementation in your pharmacy at a community level. Further, I do hope that there are many of the young pharmacists, especially from YPG section, uh, that will be part of the discussion today, as I do think that uh, from the presentation, uh, it's an ideal career path to look for to the future. FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by announcing and advancing pharmaceutical practice, science, and education. We are pleased to be delivering this event, which is sports pharmacy, practice, and education. Pharmacists support appropriate medicine selection and provision of medicine management to athletes and pharmacy operations at sporting events increasingly recognized within the world of sport as a valuable expert uh, in terms of the practice um, known as sports pharmacy. So today I am co-facilitating with uh, our, our um, coordinator, Nilan Yusman, who must really take credit for putting together this project. Thank you, Nilan. Nilan is a member of the Academic Pharmacy Stream, the International Sports Pharmacy Network, and a sports pharmacist from beautiful Turkey. We do have a few announcements to make. Firstly, this recording, this uh, stream is recorded and live streamed through YouTube. The, the recording will be available on our website, at events.fip.org. You may ask questions, and this can be inserted into the um, question box. You're welcome to provide feedback, and this is really useful because we could continue improving um, our presentations to you at webinars at fip.org. And if you're not already a member of FIP and have joined the family of FI Worldwide, please look at our website under membership and registration. In terms of our presentation today, we've divided it into three parts. First, we'd focus on the FIP sports pharmacy practice and education report. Um, combined with that, we have two presentations on sports pharmacy education opportunities that you may come across. The second part will explore the career parts in sports pharmacy. And I show you that those that are participating are participating at the absolute highest level. We will then end with a Q&A session um, that uh, will come right towards the end. So if you've got any questions, please insert them in the question uh, box. Next slide. So as usual, this le there's learning objectives in each of our presentations. And at the end of this webinar, Participants will be exploring the findings of the FIP report on sports pharmacy practice and education. We'd learn about the potential career paths for pharmacists. 
and identify opportunities where pharmacists can gain knowledge and increase their skills within sports pharmacy. Next slide. So as I said, it's in three parts. And to kick off the first part, let me introduce you to our first speaker that will be presenting the uh, FIP practice report. And that's Ashley Anderson. Ashley is a clinical sports pharmacist with an MBA and also qualified as um, IOC drugs uh, in sports certification. She's also part of the International Sports Pharmacist Network and comes from the US. Ashley, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody joining us today. We are so excited to have you here. We know there's a lot of interest in sports pharmacy. And if you haven't yet put in the chat where you are joining us from, please do that. This is also meant to be an opportunity to network with your peers. Um, in doing our research for sports pharmacy in order to write the report for FIP, the more I looked into the history of sports working or of a pharmacist working in sport, the more I found examples of where pharmacists were serving athletes or how pharmaceutical scientists were working with athletes to optimize medication use related to sport. And our predecessors in sports pharmacy emphasized drug safety, but they also worked to develop methods of detecting doping. And pharmacists were and still are involved in developing the prohibited list of drugs that are banned in sport. And you'll see this through the World Anti-Doping Agency's prohibited list. And drug use in sport is in part about, you know, understanding performance enhancing substances and how that may violate the spirit of sport. But it is also about preserving the health of the individual athlete. And that's why many pharmacists are also directly involved in the care of athletes, providing clinical pharmacy services. And in 2014, the FIP guidelines specify that all pharmacists should be aware of the benefits of exercise and how pharmacists can use our expertise to support the anti-doping movement. So to review how much progress we made from the original guidelines that were published in 2014, we put together an expert panel that began interviewing our colleagues, researching the pharmacy contributions and education that were in the literature, and we developed this descriptive report on sports pharmacy. We found that the, the findings of this report align very nicely with the FIP development goals, with several of them, but mostly with DG14, which is medicine's expertise, also D5, DG5, and DG1. And while this document provides detailed descriptions of pharmacist contribution to sport, it is not all inclusive. We recognize that. It does reflect the practices that we were able to identify. The report is based on publications we found in the literature and insights from experts within our global network of pharmacists that work in sports. And it's also based on the case examples that were submitted by FIP members when we placed a call to all membership to submit case examples in sports pharmacy. So what was a niche practice has really become a recognized specialty practice. Some additional training is necessary to navigate the medication use, especially for competitive athletes. Our pharmacy education makes us all capable to work as experts in drugs in sport. However, there's a small percentage of our current workforce that might actually be currently considered fully competent or qualified to work with athletes using a scientific base focus for sports and exercise medicine. And Practicing in sports pharmacy does require a depth of understanding of anti-doping in order to keep the athletes healthy and safe. And so why do I bring this up? Because for much of our pharmacy workforce in general, it's a gap of awareness. And I call this a blind spot because it's unintentional and it's just an unknown piece of information. Um, but these unknowns can actually lead to issues for the athlete and potentially in rare cases for the pharmacist involved as well. So just like the person in the picture could easily remove her hands from her eyes and see the light, 
The introduction to this topic of sports pharmacy and working with athletes is often enough of a starter for pharmacists to understand our importance of being drug experts when working with athletes. So as pharmacists, we may not yet be fully trained, but we can begin by asking some better questions. And let's teach our workforce to be aware and ask about physical activity, recreational sports, and competitive sports. More and more consumers are getting their information from the internet when pharmacists could be making ourselves more accessible as the trusted source of information about drugs in sport and the use of dietary supplements. We have that basic fundamental knowledge with our pharmacy education. Presenting this topic it should be part of the core pharmacy curriculum in order to increase awareness, just bringing that topic into um, our, our teaching materials. But additionally, focus training is necessary to be aware of the status of drugs in sport. And that begins with an awareness of prohibited substances and prohibited methods, because having a clinical indication alone for the use of a medication is not enough for an athlete to justify their use in sport for a prohibited substance. And then secondly, sports pharmacy practice is so much more than this basic awareness of the anti-doping movement. Our expertise in medicine allows us to customize drug answers for the people that we are working with. So the International Sports Pharmacist Network was founded in order to connect pharmacists who are interested in sport and encourage partnerships and collaboration. Today, we have over a thousand registrants and maybe up to a hundred participants right here, here with us right now. And so I encourage you to reach out and make some connections and also complete the continuing education and professional development that is available and begin training in sports pharmacy and especially training in anti-doping. But also look for volunteer opportunities like coaching, refere refereeing, or even just set up and take down at your local events. This is how you begin working in sports pharmacy. And if you have time, join us at the end of the month for our International Sports Pharmacy Symposium. And the next presenters are going to go real in depth. And so I want to leave a lot of time for them. And I'll be available for questions at the end. So back to you, Sham. Thank you very much, Ashley. Let me now introduce our next speaker, and that's Mark Stewart. Mark is an operations development senior manager at the International Testing Agency in Switzerland, 20 years of experience. And Mark is also currently the International Olympic Committee Medical and Science Commission, uh, World Anti-Doping Agency, and the European uh, Olympic Committee. Plenty of experience. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Sham. Um, well, I'm really pleased to be able to provide you an insight into sports pharmacy in the Olympic setting today. A pharmacy services really are an important and integral part of medical services for the athletes, the team officials and the spectators at the Olympic Games. Pharmacists are at the front line when it comes to drug use and supply to Olympic and Paralympic athletes. And therefore, good education and training is really key to the success of this pharmacy service. In this specialist environment, pharmacists require an advanced level of sports-specific pharmacological and clinical knowledge in order to effectively contribute to the healthcare of the athlete. They're also responsible for supporting anti-doping during the games by implementing robust systems of supply of drugs to athletes and by the provision of information to athletes on drugs banned in sport and their permitted alternatives. The scope and locations for pharmacy provisions really are diverse, from services in the athlete village, designated hospitals and ambulance service across the city, to over 150 separate medical rooms stocked with essential medicines at over 40 competition venues. Um, with all this, the service must be accessible for healthcare providers from just about every country in the world, cover a range of drugs used in sports medicine, primary care and emergency medicine, and present international best practice when it comes to drug use. The polyclinic pharmacy in the athlete village is the heart of the pharmacy service. And this really acts as a central coordination hub for the venue services. This is the Rio 2016 pharmacy team. 
Um, usually up to 100 pharmacists are needed to cover both the Olympic and Paralympic Games across multiple villages. Um, they dispense prescriptions for both the local doctors working at the Games and over 1,500 visiting team doctors. Um, they also supply all of the medicines to the clinical departments with the polyclinic. It's a very busy service with over 6,000 prescriptions expected over the course of the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm going to show you a few Olympic pharmacies over time. Uh, this photo on the screen is the Beijing 2008 pharmacy. Uh, next slide, thank you. That's it. Um, a pharmacy is always at the front of the polyclinic for the best patient flow, so athletes can collect their prescription on the way out, free of charge. Um, but pharmacy services really do evolve over time and are often very unique to the host country according to local regulations and professional practice in that country. Um, this is the London 2012 pharmacy. It was built to reflect the evolving professional role of pharmacists in the UK at the time. Now, this was the first time a pharmacist-led minor illness scheme was provided at an Olympic Games. And you can see the design was really to enhance athlete communication. You can see the low counters there for uh, wheelchair athletes to also uh, attend the pharmacy. Move forward 10 years and we have the unprecedented circumstances for the Tokyo 2020 and the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic Games, uh, which is pictured here. These were the first games ever held in a pandemic with a huge impact on the way pharmacists delivered the services. Now, interestingly, a significant lower volume of prescriptions were dispensed at these games compared to previous ones. There's less drugs dispensed for upper respiratory tract infections and gastrointestinal illnesses. Now, this was likely due to the extreme but effective infection control measures in place for COVID, which also had an impact on other infectious diseases in the village. So overall, they were both very healthy games. A number of drug safety mechanisms to prevent inadvertent doping is integrated into the pharmacy systems at the Olympics. You can see pharmacy shelves there labeled with the WADA status as a reminder to the dispensing pharmacists. And uh, the electronic pharmacy dispensing system also alerts the pharmacist in this environment when a prohibited drug is dispensed. Um, a unique Olympic pharmacy prescription form is used by the team doctors to prescribe from the polyclinic pharmacy. Now this has provision for signatures of the athlete, the team doctor and the pharmacist to provide consent if a prohibited drug is dispensed. And all the prohibited drugs are labeled clearly with a warning sticker if they are dispensed. A pharmacy guide is developed with information on drugs available in the host country, along with the current WADA status. And this outlines a formulary available prescribed by all the prescribers at the Games. This set of medicines is focused on the clinical needs of athletes, particularly of the needs of sports injury and sports medicine. And it provides a selection that represents drugs used internationally. A medicines information service supports the visiting team doctors from just about every country in the world. And they provide support for clinical drug information, international medicine selection and local uh, variations, local options, and also advice on the wider prohibited status of medicines. The selection of medicines kept at the sport competition venues is based on the risk of the sport or the environmental risk factors at the venue, the level of emergency service and expertise of the medical teams on site and the capacity of the venue. Now, the IOC has a recommended set of drugs that should be available at every Olympic venues. Um, also at venues, standardised sets of drugs are coordinated by the pharmacy team. Uh, and you can see different sets of drugs for various scenarios, from a first response bag with simple analgesia, through to medical bags with the full range of equipment and drugs to deal with most medical emergencies. A separate stock of non-urgent medicines is kept in the athlete medical room at the venues, and this covers common medicines for primary care conditions and sports injuries. Um, the pharmacy team will manage these stocks throughout the games, uh, and this, this is the pharmacy team at work at the Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics there in the photo. In 2019, the IOC and the IPC introduced the first Olympic and Paralympic model formulary. Now, this was developed in response to wide variation in the use and availability of medicines between previous host countries. 
Now, this model formally sets the international standard for which drugs are to be made available for prescribing and to be, to be stocked at the venues. It aims to standardise the drug treatment options available at all summer, winter and youth Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, and it's also aimed to protect the health of the athlete th through the provision of safe and evidence-based medicine options. Since 2016, the IOC and the World Anti-Doping Agency have collaborated on training aimed at increasing anti-doping knowledge among healthcare providers at the Olympics. And currently there's three online modules that are mandatory for all team physicians coming to the Olympics to complete, covering prohibited drugs, complying with the IOC needle policy, and the importation of medicines into the host country of the Games. So I hope that has given you some insight into the, the scope of pharmacy services at the Olympics and highlighted the need for expert education for pharmacists working in this specialist environment. Um, I'll now pass to my colleague and fellow sports pharmacist, Professor David Mottram of Liverpool John Moores University, who will outline the education initiatives fostered by the IOC to support sports pharmacists in this area. Uh, including an exciting announcement of a new IOC program launching in 2024. Over to you, David. Hi, well, thank you, Mark, uh, for the introduction. And also thank you for that fascinating insight into pharmacy services at major sporting events. I have to say it brought back some very fond memories of working as a pharmacist, both at the London and Rio Olympic and Paralympic Games. It really is a a fantastic opportunity if you ever get the chance. David, was, if I uh, just interrupt, think if you could just turn your camera on, I think. Oh, sure, sure. Thank, Sorry. thank you. That's okay, thanks. Uh, now, as Mark and Ashley have uh, highlighted in their presentations, uh, working as a pharmacist at a major sporting event is a unique experience. And that, of course, requires very specialist knowledge and skills. So consequently, uh, Mark and I approached the International Olympic Committee with the idea of designing and developing an education program on the use of drugs in sport. And this will be aimed at athlete support personnel, those people who act uh, in support of athletes in their endeavors uh, to, to perform. And we were particularly interested in reaching out to healthcare professionals. Now, we were aware that uh, the International Olympic Committee, through its Medical and Scientific Commission, has for a number of years offered a range of online education programmes through an organisation called Sports Oracle. Now, as you can see on this slide, uh, which was taken from the Sports Oracle website, the IOC programmes include a range of diploma and certificate courses on the subjects of sports nutrition, sports medicine, physical therapies, and mental health. As you can see from the circled uh, programme there, we are now pleased to say that we have this course that Mark and I have designed and developed on drugs in sport. Next slide, please. So this course was first offered in 2018, and to date we've had 173 graduates, uh, some of whom are here today, uh, both the presenters and also in the audience, and these are graduates from 62 countries. As you can see from this uh, picture, uh, those countries really do encompass the, the whole world. So it really is truly a global course that we are running. Next slide, please. Now, the target audience uh, for the course are mainly healthcare professionals, but also specialists in anti-doping. And as you can see from this slide, although it is uh, not very clear, uh, pharmacists, who are the top bar there, comprise the highest proportion of our students. So almost 40% of the graduates from the course have been pharmacists. But we do cater for other healthcare professionals as well. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the aim of the course is to educate those personnel who advise and support athletes, as I said before, in order to maintain the athlete's good health and well-being. So it's not just about doping. And these are not just elite athletes that we're talking about, but anyone who participates in sport from recreational level through to competitive level and up to the elite level. So anybody who might come into a pharmacy could receive help and advice from people who are well trained in the areas that we're going to be talking about. Now, the primary focus for the education programme is on the rational and safe use of medicines by athletes. 
and of course, in the prevention of doping. So in this slide, uh, we can see that the course runs for a period of six months and it's studied on a part-time basis. It's delivered through distance learning since, as you saw in the previous slide, our students are literally located around the world. So they can all access the course from wherever they are in, in the globe. The course comprises five modules, which are presented by internationally recognized experts in their field of study. And the modules cover a variety of subject areas, which are shown on this slide. So module one is an introduction into why athletes need to take drugs or supplements for their health and well-being, but also the problems associated with doping in sport. Module two details the international regulations of doping in sport and describes the organizations such as WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, which are responsible for doping control in sport. And we also give details of the rules and regulations under which these organizations operate. In module three, we emphasize that drug use in sport is not just about doping. Therefore, we explore the areas of therapeutics that particularly impact on athletes, such as sports injuries, athletes with conditions such as asthma, diabetes, or hormonal disorders, and also the special considerations for athletes with disabilities. In module four, we place emphasis on the importance of clean sport by exploring the problems associated with supplement use. And after all, most athletes do take supplements quite extensively. But also we look at the prevention of inadvertent doping where athletes may take medicines and not realize they're taking prohibited substances. And then finally, module five looks at healthcare provision at major sporting events as Mark has so eloquently described in his presentation. Okay, next slide, please. So the programme is delivered principally through pre-recorded lectures from our subject experts. And we have around six lectures per module, uh, which students can access at their own pace and from their own place of work. Of course, we also provide extensive learning resources for their self-directed learning as well. So these might be reference sources to uh, research papers, to books, uh, but also to websites. In addition to this, there's an online discussion forum for students where they can discuss current issues amongst themselves with tutor input where appropriate. And then we run two Zoom sessions for each cohort of students at the beginning at the end. This gives students an opportunity to meet each other, even though it's only virtually, but it does give them an opportunity to see their fellow, fellow students on the cohort. The assessment for the course uh, is mainly through an end of course online exam. And this includes multi-choice questions, but also short answer questions. So the students complete this examination online. The students also complete uh, during the, or throughout the course, logs of module learning, in which for each module, they describe how they have actually implemented their learning into their everyday work practice. Now, this is a very useful facility because it gives the students an ability to reflect on what they've been learning and to think how the uh, material that they have learned they can put into their everyday practice. And these logs are assessed at the end of the programme of studies. So, of course, successful students uh, at the end of the course graduate with an IOC certificate in drugs in sport. And they have the opportunity to attend a graduation ceremony, which is held at the IOC headquarters in Lausanne in Switzerland. And you may recognise on that photograph um, somebody who spoke to us a short while ago, Ashley. Ashley was one of our graduates and I was honoured to be at the graduation ceremony when she received her award. Next slide, please. Now, Throughout the, the course, uh, we do try to give students an opportunity to uh, appreciate uh, what career and professional development opportunities they have after graduation. So some of these are outlined on this slide. So within their general working practice, <clears throat> they have the opportunity to, to meet, up, meet up with athletes uh, who come along to the pharmacy and um, they can give them effective and um, helpful advice on the drug use and supplement use that they, they may be participating in. They also have the opportunity to meet up with other healthcare professionals and they can act as a source of advice for these healthcare professionals about the issues of drug use in sport. 
So in general practice, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for, for athletes to put their knowledge into practice. They can also work with other sports organizations. So these may be at a local, national, or even international level, where they can uh, collaborate with colleagues within the sports organization, again, advising on the rational and um, safe use of drugs within sports. So these might be national uh, anti-doping organizations or sports federations. Now, one specialist area which uh, some of our graduates have participated in is that of becoming an accredited doping control officer. Now, doping control officers are trained by the International um, Testing Agency. And these are the people who go out and uh, receive blood and urine samples from athletes for testing. So many of our graduates have actually uh, participated in becoming a doping control officer. Now, major sporting events, of course, we've mentioned several times and Mark has elaborated on that, so I don't need to say much more about major sporting events. But the final area where um, our graduates can use their knowledge uh, is in the area of research, research and education. So they can use their knowledge that they've gained on the course to give education programmes to students at um, colleges, at schools, to athletes, to other athlete support personnel, and so on. And of course, in those who have an opportunity to work with universities, they can undertake research on issues concerning, concerning drug use and misuse in sport. Now, of course, in the uh, second part of this um, uh, webinar today, uh, we will be listening from some of our colleagues who have been involved in these very areas. So it'll be interesting to hear what they have to say. But just before we um, go on to that uh, section of the programme, uh, we have some very exciting news. Mark and I have just received information from Sports Oracle, who are the people who run our IOC programmes, that uh, we, they are planning to launch a one-year diploma course in sports pharmacy uh, in 2024. So this will be a, pr a progression from our current IOC certificate course in drugs in sport. And of course, it will be specifically designed for pharmacists. So we're very excited about this new development. As I say, it's due to be launched in 2024, and we will, of course, keep you posted on developments. If you have any expressions of interest uh, in this course and uh, what it's going to be about, you can email us on info at sportspharmacy.com. So I think that's enough from me. Uh, we now look forward to hearing from some of our colleagues who have experienced uh, being a sports pharmacist in a variety of fields. So I'd like now to, to hand over to them. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mark and David. That has been really exciting. And you saw, um, David, the number of hands that were clapping uh, on the introduction of that um, final slide that you had, the opportunity for pharmacists to further their careers in this path. So we're going to now uh, move to exploring the career pathways and talk to some of the pharmacists that are in practice and it really gives me great pressure to introduce my African colleague from Egypt, uh, Moe El Ghaffar. He's uh, a sports pharmacist and an anti-doping consultant, um, an IOC uh, drug and sport accredited pharmacist, and he comes from Egypt. He has vast experience, a public educator, a free freelance advisor, advisor to some of the sports teams in his country in Egypt, uh, welcome on board, uh, Mohe. Uh, thank you, Sham. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, pharmacists have a very vital and important practical role in the field of sport medicine in general and in anti doping in particular. Let's kick off the game and delve into the practical world of sports pharmacy and anti doping. Next, please. When we talk about the, the importance of pharmacists in the anti-doping, we are talking about the value and urgent need for this vital value. The question is, what value do we have as pharmacists? What is the need for this value and who needs this value? Let's explore the answers together. First, we have to understand the relationship between athletes and medicine. We can summarize this relationship in two main aspects therapeutic use for the treatment of medical conditions like muscle injuries, asthma, ADHD, and so on, and the use of medications for performance enhancement. Next, please. 
The athletes may use the medications for performance enhancement for ergogenic effects to enhance strength or improve recovery. They also may use anabolic agents to enhance protein senses and muscle mass or use medications for its stimulating properties. Next, please. Therefore, we can summarize the drugs used in sports by athletes and define them as performance enhancing drugs. Enhancing physical performance could be defined in one of two ways. One describes the legal use of the, uh, the legal use, uh, and the other describes the illegal use of medications by athletes. The legal definition is the use of drugs to reduce effects of injury or disease that would compromise an athlete's normal performance. The illegal use definition is the use of drugs in the use of drugs with intention of increasing performance in the absence of any compromising injury or disease. Next, please. In order to fight against doping in sport internationally and to protect athletes from cheating and to maintain the rules of fair play, the International Olympic Committee convened the first World Conference on Doping in Sport in Lausanne 1999, which resulted in the establishment of World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA. The WADA has a code and international standards to organize all rules and procedures related to anti-doping. The most important part of the anti-doping regulations and international standards is the prohibited list. Next, please. The prohibited list is considered the core and the backbone of the anti-doping. Most anti-doping procedures and regulations hover around the prohibited list. The prohibited list is the comprehensive document identifying substance and methods prohibited in sport. Next, please. When we, do, when we take a look uh, at some parts of uh, the prohibited list, we'll find that it depends on the pharmacology, particularly pharmacokinetics of uh, substance. For example, naming some of them by IUPAC name. The prohibition of some of them is depending on the dosing form and concentration, like some beta of two agonist, sabotamol and formiterol. The prohibition of other substance depends on its urine concentration, like pseudoephedrine. The prohibition of many of the prohibited list is prohibited in competition only, which depends on the pharmacokinetic and the T hub of each substance. We, we conclude from this that dealing with prohibited list to understand it and to use drugs to treat athletes legally and to correct uh, and correctly without violating anti-doping rules requires a pharmacist. Who will who, who require a pharmacist who is fully familiar with pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, and pharmaceutical science in general to help and support the sports medicine team, athletes, and sports communities. And this is the value we have as pharmacists. Next, please. We can say that the pharmacist who has the value is the guide for the understanding the prohibited list. And on the other hand, the athletes and the sports communities have a needing for the pharmacist and his value to guard them from anti-doping rule violations. Next, please. From this point, my practical role as sports pharmacist in anti-doping and anti-doping education started in 2017. As a result of my own work in the field of medical supplies for a sports club, I built a strong relationship with many sports medicine physicians and physiotherapists, especially in the field of football in Egypt. Many of them asked me about many things related to the prohibited list, and I found that many athletes face difficult to deal with the prohibited list in its current form. And as you know, the general public deals with drugs through its street names. So, as you see, I decided to make and create a pictured prohibited list by trade name in Egypt to be more easily to deal with it. And I gifted it to the Egyptian Football Association and the two mini clubs in Egypt. And I updated it annually according to WADA prohibited list. Next please. When we talk about the practical fields and the career paths available to sports pharmacists, we are talking about many different opportunities. In 2020, I joined the medical committee of the Egyptian Football Association and participated in many local and regional sporting events 
such as Arab Cup in 2021. Sport esteem and doping education, one of the most important practical areas of the pharmacist in the anti-doping is the education of athletes. Since 2022, I have given many education lectures to many football teams, such as Al Ahli Club, the African champion. The, port, the sports pharmacists also have a vital role in educating medical practitioners, uh, the principle of anti-doping and prohibited list through medical conferences. Of course, one of the most important practical roles of the sports pharmacist is the education of pharmacists and the qualifying them to become a sports pharmacist. As you see in the last picture in the right is an example of an introductory lecture I gave at the Faculty of Pharmacy, Alexander University in Egypt. Next, please. One of the most important and sensitive rules of the sports pharmacist is membership of the Therapeutic Use Exception Committee. Since January 2023, I have been a member of the Therapeutic Use Exception Committee of three international federations, Virtus, EPSA, and, Ability Sport, and World Ability Sport. All of them are Paralympic federations. As a sports pharmacist, we play a vital role in the committee in reviewing the medical documents and reviewing, and reviewing the doses and alternatives of various athletes around the world to give them a therapeutic use exception for the use of prohibited substance in accordance with the international standards for therapeutic use exception. Next, please. In athlete has many athlete support personnel in different fields. It's time for pharmacists to be one of the main athlete support personnel. Next, please. My advice to any pharmacist to be sports pharmacist, follow these five key points. Passion. A passion for sports, sports pharmacy, and the anti-doping will motivate you to learn, educate, and increase your knowledge about this field. Networking and communication. Engage with athletes and sports physicians around you and declare yourself your passion and expertise in anti-doping. Take the initiative. Don't wait for the others. Look for the opportunity and take this and take the first step and be initiator. Next, please. Now we can answer the question. The, what, now we can answer what we asked about in the beginning. We, as sports pharmacists, have many values to satisfy needs of athletes and sports communities. Next, please. Always remember to be sports pharmacist is to be guide and guard to the athletes. Follow your, follow your passion and take the initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Moa. That was really interesting. And it's great to see the number of activities that you perform uh, in this field of sports uh, pharmacy. I have pleasure in bringing on our next speaker, Claire May. Claire is a senior lecturer in medicine use, lead for interprofessional education and professionalism at the University of Brighton in the UK. She has vast experience in both Olympic, para, Paralympic, uh, Commonwealth Games and professional golf as well. So welcome, Claire. Thank you so much, Sham. So my journey, I just wanted to give you an idea of maybe another side of being a sports pharmacist. So um, Moyen explained a lot about anti-doping and where your expertise within sports pharmacy might be utilised. There is another arm to um, sports pharmacy, which is the one that I ventured down. And my journey began in London 2012, where I met Stuart, Stuart and David. Um, and I was a pharmacist within the Olympics and the Paralympics at London 2012. It was a transformative experience for me. Um, I didn't quite expect to have the kind of reaction that I did to the time that I spent within the athletes village. I really didn't appreciate how much interaction we were going to have with the athletes and actually with the athlete support personnel as well. And with the introduction of the minor ailment scheme, that meant that actually our role really was front and centre. And it gave um, the polyclinic at which we were based a real um, 
buzz around the whole uh, environment so it was fantastic and actually what was really important for me was that interprofessional working environment it was the first time that I truly felt that I was working with my allied healthcare professionals in a collaborative way for the benefit of of a, of a patient and that patient being our athlete and at that games I met the chief medical officer of the European PGA tour as it was at that time um, and really developed a relationship around um, what would be best for his players within his environment that he would be working with. And we talked about what a sports pharmacist might bring. And to be honest, in 2012, I really didn't understand that term, sports pharmacist. I was a pharmacist who had an interest in sport. And it's really only been over a period of time where I've been able to see that term sports pharmacists develop and actually I think in December of last year when the FIP supported our global view to sports pharmacy it really kind of solidified what that sports pharmacist role is the need for the additional education and knowledge to actually move from being a pharmacist interested in sport to being a confident, competent ph sports pharmacist. So I think there is a real transition from 2012 and going to work at the PGA Tour. I realized that this was a very new role and I would have to really negotiate with the PGA Tour around what activities I would be um, happy to undertake and what activities I felt were outside of my scope. And this is where some of it really does kind of align to, I think, some of the new evolving rules for pharmacists, certainly within the UK. And having just recently been in Denver and presenting at a lifelong learning conference with Ashley and another colleague, Athena Cannon, I realised that independent prescribing is something that's becoming more of a role for pharmacists across the globe and so I very much see where I negotiated my activities as a sports pharmacist with the PGA Tour around thinking about that scope of practice and being acutely aware of what is the rules that I can undertake and what I need to push on to others or need to kind of be confident to say actually no. Next slide please Ashley. So having been at London 2012 and worked in the Olympics and worked in the Paralympics and then introducing myself as this role of the sports pharmacist in the PGA Tour, I really settled on um, the roles that I felt that I could really contribute to the most within uh, the PGA Tour would be around medicines management and clinical governance. Some people might think they're quite dry topics, might think that actually, you know, that's very processy, but it really was an in for me with the part of the team because it was built up of um, physiotherapists, nutritionists and medics. And really the role of medicines management and clinical governance is where I genuinely felt that I was going to make the most impact. It was my unique selling point and I think that's something that we all need to think about and when Moyan was saying you know declare yourself, think about what it is that you're going to declare, be confident you know what it is that you can deliver and probably don't over promise is a bit of a, a word of caution. So having had the experience at London 2012, I felt comfortable thinking about drug formularies, advising on policies around supply, administration and storage, and then actually developing and really kind of embedding myself within the team to have that respect that I then went into the TUE committees to provide the pharmacist side of, of um, the aspects that we needed to consider when thinking about patients or athletes within uh, their clinical areas of need for treatment. So for me, that was a really key transition from being someone who was providing a lot of, I suppose, policies and uh, clinical governance aspects to actually getting involved in the clinical uh, therapeutic 
decisions around patients and and their um, clinical needs. Next slide, please, Ashley. So just from my perspective, trying to get you to maybe before you go into that arena of trying to find your position within an organization, just to kind of think about what are those benefits, what are those challenges that you may need to overcome to ensure that you're really performing to your best and providing the team what they need to do that they need from you so really showing your value your added value in the team so certainly benefits that came very quickly to my roles within both the olympics i've also um been to birmingham in 2022 for the commonwealth games was this holistic view so helping uh, that multidisciplinary team to be thinking about that holistic view, thinking about, well, what are we asking the patient to do? How frequently are we asking the patient to use the medicine? Is that going to fit with their training program? Is that going to fit with their competition? Is that appropriate against the WADA guidelines? And then thinking about, well, actually, what can we do to optimize the treatment for the patient and to provide that patient with some education? So I know that most people who have had experience within sports will tell you that um, medicines get passed around between either athletes or athlete support personnel. And this is unwittingly sometimes because they're not educated around what the harms could be. So it might be OK for me but it's possibly not okay for another person. So we need to really up the ante with the education and really explain to patients when we're giving out those medicines why we feel they're right for them, but should not be shared amongst the team. Um, as we know, it does happen. We can also be that nice link between the medical team and the anti-doping. Um, so from my own experience within the PGA Golf, I have a very good relationship with the anti-doping uh, lead. And we talk regularly around things that are maybe cropping up that we need to then push back as a bit of education. So it's a, a really great way of trying to, again, add that value on your role. I have a great relationship with the physiotherapist. So we're able to discuss what it is that they can do from their rules and um, if they're kind of being challenged by the player as to wanting something that they can't do you know trying to really embed that food first um kind of uh, approach as well so making sure that uh, the physios are are always having the same mantra the same discussions the same um, messages so that we're all coming from the same place I suppose the challenges are always the things that we're going to come across whenever we move into a fairly uh, new, and I don't think sports pharmacy is new by any stretch of the imagination, but we're certainly seeing a groundswell of pharmacists being interested. And it's great to see so many of you here today from across the globe. And I really hope that this is one of many future uh, webinars and discussions that we can have. But you might come across because many people see pharmacy or pharmacists as a bit of a policing, you know, preventing things from happening, not wanting to do this or providing more hurdles, people might think, because policies may be unfamiliar to them. Um, but they may not see the risks, the inherent risks, if we're not there to try and aid advice, you know, cajole into the way in which we think would be the best way to provide. I think remuneration is always um, a challenging area when we talk about sports pharmacy and possibly, you know, pharmacists in general across the globe, having got colleagues from all corners of the world. Um, you know, I think sometimes we are so willing to put the patient and everybody else first that we forget about what is our true value. And sometimes we undervalue ourselves. So it's really important to be thinking, well, how much should I be being remunerated? Is this a role in which I'm actually needing to be remunerated or is this a role for professional development and I'm willing to do this as a volunteer to build my uh, experience to build my exposure 
And then, you know, sometimes you need to be thinking about how are you communicating? How do you get those true benefits across? So how are you going to talk to people with the language that is right for them and the language that they understand? So next slide, please, Ashley. So a couple of key areas to consider that could be a beyond medicines management, beyond clinical governance, beyond anti-doping. And they could be things like injury prevention, thinking about like things like ciprofloxacin, being mindful of um, potential tendinitis that could be associated with that antibiotic. Would there be another choice that could be added in or, or exchanged or making sure that the athlete is aware of any muscle weakness happening? It's that really good counseling that we can give that's unique to pharmacists thinking about optimization of treatment, you know, to maximize that performance. Um, I know now Ashley and I uh, and Athena, when we were in Denver, we had many conversations about patients, athletes, uh, being given uh, caffeinated products, maybe on a trip if they're going long distance being given caffeinated products uh, as they go through the the journey but then being expected to sleep because they're going to be in competition the next day but actually the caffeinated um, drink that they've been given on the journey is actually keeping them awake I know uh, a, a participant today uh, Stephen uh, Sembler he's done a uh, piece around managing sleep disorders uh, you can find that on LinkedIn a great, great piece to talk about how do we advise on things like management of sleep disorders so really using our pharmaceutical skills which doesn't always mean pharmaceutical intervention, of course, but, you know, thinking about uh, sleep hygiene and things like that. And then thinking about recovery time and where the use of NSAIDs is appropriate or not appropriate. I'm really trying to tailor that treatment plan for the athletes in front of us, not for others. Next slide, please. I just think this is a week great infograph um, and it's courtesy of Athena Cannon so I mentioned myself Ashley and Athena did a um, talk in Denver um, and it was a much longer workshop than than the 10 minutes that I have today but I thought this is a really nice pictorial way of thinking where can I assist where can I help so I'll leave that we thought with you with you uh, and thank you very much for listening Thank you very much, Claire. Um, we'll quickly move on to the next speaker. Um, we got a, a two more speakers, so the Q&A might be a short session. I'm glad some of the speakers are answering some of your questions that's online already. So the next speaker is Robert Nickel. Uh, Robert, unfortunately, is in an area that cannot connect, so we're fortunate to have his presentations with us. Uh, he, Robert is from the, U, uh, the US uh, and a CEO of uh, many companies listed there. He's also the previous president of uh, the Californian Pharmacy Association and received um, many awards, including uh, Pharmacist of the Year in California, Innovative Pharmacist of the Year. So I'm going to now pass on to Ashley to control his uh, slide presentation. Ashley, over to you. So these next couple of slides will be pre-recorded, but Robert is joining us in the background. Good morning. How are you all? It's, a, it's quite the honor to be invited to speak this morning to international sports pharmacists all over the world. Um, very, very humbled to have this opportunity, very excited to see almost 20 years later, the growth in sports pharmacy as a practice and as a profession. And my name is Robert Nickel, and I am a sports pharmacist. I was um, asked to talk about developing products for sports pharmacy. And we'll start off with a, a small picture there that just shows me at the USA Olympic Games in 2004, almost 20 years ago, and wearing my same USA Team 2004 shirt that I wore back then, although I looked a little younger. And then following that, I'm going to have her play just a brief uh, video 
which was about a product that I did create back at the Olympic days called Wasabi Rub. They're going to get decongestant. We have blisters. We have many people coming in with blister injuries. He is the first pharmacist ever to work here at the Olympic Games, and he's from Southern California. That was the right pharmacist at the right time. What Robert Nickel does for the athletes is priceless. Not just giving them meds for the common cold, but actually coming up with special compounds to meet their needs. It's creativity. It's, it's like cooking. And once you get that formulation that works, the athletes are going, I love it, I want more, I want more, I want more. And it's not just the athletes that benefit from his compounds and creativity. It's been a fabulous addition. Before, we used to take all of our drugs with us, and that was all we had. One of the most popular concoctions is something that Nickel calls wasabi, because it's green and it's hot. It goes on cool. And then as the athlete starts working out and exercising, it'll start heating up. And they, and they love the feel of it. We have marathon runners that are using it, uh, track and field athletes that are using it. Just like the athletes, Nichols has been preparing for these games and managed to come up with a special compound just for Athens. It consists of 200 different items. It's a giant honor for me to be here and, and do the job and make it work and make it happen. It's been real nice. Video, and you've seen me. Let's just move on real quickly because we only have a few minutes to talk about selling sports products. And so the first thing that you have to think about is what, right? What's your product gonna be? What's your service going to be? Are you selling yourself as a consultant? Are you selling uh, pharmacogenomics? Are you selling consulting? Are you selling nutritional supplies? Or do you, do you have a medical device? Have you teamed up with another company to, to have a medical device. Are you selling drugs? Maybe you're selling drugs like I do. Uh, you're selling um, uh, over-the-counter products, you're selling supplements, you're selling prescription drugs. Maybe you're a compounding pharmacist and you're compounding really cool certain formulations that you believe in that are gonna work for the athletes. So you have to decide what's your product. Uh, we wanna get in the game, we wanna sell something, right? but what is your product or service going to be? Then, how are you gonna reach that market? If your product is designed for a certain class of athlete or a certain class of athletic trainer um, or market, how are you going to sell that product? Are you gonna sell it direct to consumer? Shopify is one of the easiest ways nowadays. Um, it's far superior to Amazon and you can set up a Shopify account and you can pay a very minimum monthly payment and you can be right in there selling right away. It doesn't matter how you're gonna drive people to your site. And so how are you gonna do that? Everybody's using social media right now. That seems to be the number one way. But you always have to remember that there's always another way. There's always that future way. What's five years from now, what's gonna drive people to your product? What's going to drive people to your market in five years? And start thinking about that now so that you have an idea of how you're going to move yourself through the market. You can jump in doing what everybody else is doing, podcasts, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook posts, groups, conversations, all of those kind of things. They're all good because they get the message out there, they get your face out there, they get your branding out there, and people will start learning about you. And in today's market, you become a brand and people trust you, they believe in you, they want to listen to you, and they want to buy your products. So that's where you want to get yourself to. And how do you, how do you get there? There's also shows and conventions. You can go to those. I mean, it's unlimited the number of shows you can go to, and those are important and they do help. The first ones I went to, I would just stand there. I couldn't even afford a booth. I would stand there in my pharmacy coat behind a, a table with not even a banner. I didn't have a banner. And I would just wait for people to walk by and I would start telling them about my wasabi rub and my sports pharmacy program and everything that I had to offer. And it was, it was the passion behind what I was saying that got their attention, more so than the product or service that I was trying to sell. So you have um, the, the advantage that we have today, and as we're having this conversation right now, it's all over the world. So we have 
a global opportunity to promote our products and our services and ourselves as a brand. So who is your market going to be? Is it going to be professional athletes? Is it going to be amateur athletes? Is it going to be weekend warriors? Is it going to be high school? Is it going to be, or is it going to be the people that take care of athletes, like certified athletic trainers, physical therapists, team physicians, orthopedists, nutritional advisors? We don't know, right? You don't know, but you need to know. So you have to figure out who is your market. Who is going to help you drive the market? Do you need to talk to athletic trainers or do you need to just go straight to athletes or do you need athletes speaking on your behalf? Do you have sports medicine physicians? Do you have colleges? And then what's your sport? Does your product or service cover all sports or is it specific to running or swimming or golf or race car driving or ultimate fighting experience? So what is the group of athletes or the program that you're trying to get to? That is the question. So what is your product and who are you going to sell it to? And what's next? Why? There's my short timer there. So why do you love your product or service? You need to know why, and you need to be able to exude why you need to be able to show your passion, your desire, your confidence and your love of your product or service. If you don't love your product, nobody else is going to love the product guaranteed. So you have to get out there. You have to promote it. You have to love it, have confidence, show it, display it, use it, talk about it all the time. Have a, have a dream big, dream crazy. Nothing is impossible. And more than anything, never give up. You've seen all the memes. You've seen all of the things, the guy digging in the thing, and he's about ready to give up. He's tired of digging and the gold is that far away. Never give up. Always push forward. Always push forward with passion confidence, courage, when you're just sweating and tired and you think nobody loves you, you'll find that one. And when you find one, you'll find 10. When you find 10, you'll find a hundred. So that's what you need to do. Find your people, get your product, know who your market is, know why you love your product, get other people to love your product and get out there, sell it, promote it and become a sports pharmacist that we can all be proud of. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the speakers. And I look forward to meeting any of you anytime. Find me on LinkedIn. I would love to have a conversation. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Robert's online. So if there's any questions, um, he will assist us to answer it. Uh, my very last speaker is uh, Soma Helvika, uh, is an IOC accredited sports pharmacist, lecturer of sports pharmacy in Ghazi University, uh, also a, a very experienced pharmacist of 20 years, community pharmacist, uh, and has created a, a curriculum for Turkish pharmaceutical community after his uh, IOC certificate. So welcome on board, uh, Soma. Up to you. Thank you, Shem. Hello, everyone. Thanks for your kind invitation. Now uh, I will present you the educational development of sports pharmacy. Let me share my screen firstly. And thanks to all participants. Yes, this is a, short, a brief introduction. I will not read uh, detailed. You can see all details. According to the guideline for the role of the pharmacist against doping in, uh, sorry, let me, okay. In support, which publishes in 2014, FIP has declared specific responsibilities and duties as a recommendation to the stakeholders of the pharmaceutical community. When all these suggestions are carefully examined, 
it is revealed that the most important issue that needs to be strengthened is education. The purpose of this presentation, it is the sharing of experiences related to, to the development of the educational organization of sports pharmacy expertise in Turkey with global interaction. At the end of the day, we hope to inspire for the better educational developments. This is a reminder for the FIP's quite line. There were inspiring recommendations, as I said. The first one was pharmaceutical associations should promote the provision to pharmacists of educational materials on doping designs to meet the needs of those involved in sports. Pharmacists should keep up to date on the contents of WADA code. Pharmacists should have an educator, educator role also. Pharmaceutical manufacturers should cooperate with the WADA by informing the agency of the marketing of any new medicinal product that has the potential to be used for improving performance in sports. When we carefully analyze these recommendations, it is revealed that the most important impact is developing a special educational system. Japan sports pharmacy movement could be a relevant method to apply it because also this is the beginning of the sports pharmacy movement. As we know, in 2009, J JADA, Japan Anti-Doping Agency and uh, Japan Pharmaceutical Association come to get, came together and launched the sports pharmacy movement. Uh, you can visit also the official website for detailed information. And, and hundreds of pharmacists took action for these movements anti-doping workshops for athletes and support personnel, advice on medicine, outsource activities uh, to disseminate information to athletes and public, workshop sessions for sports pharmacists also. You can see the JADA certification process also. I will not uh, read by details, but this is a good model for us. And uh, there are conditions for continuation and conditions for renewal. These, they were all clarified at the beginning of the, this moment. And you can see the materials, support pharmacist materials. You can also find all the materials detail by detailed in uh, official websites, such as infographics, videos, PDF document, education documents. And as a result, until the Tokyo 2020, nearly 10,000 pharmacies certified, uh, pharmacists have been certified as a sports pharmacist. This is so important, sorry. And another milestone program is IOC Drugs in Sports Course, uh, as Mr. Motram mentioned, a comprehensive program for the international standards focusing, especially the major events. And another reference source, uh, WADA code, uh, which is updated in 2021, International Standards for Education. This is the first time uh, just included this code. By regarding these all these important educational methods, we designed a special educational system in three different levels. One, one program for students, undergraduate level, one program for pharmacists, continuous professional development uh, programs and courses. And the other one is program for sports pharmacies, a master degree program. You can see the content of the curriculum and you will also check by detail when you will watch the video again. This is the elective course for the third grades and uh, online CPD program for the pharmacists, graduated pharmacists. More than 120 certified pharmacists between 2020 and 23. Sports pharmacy online course programs were put into practice for four times in Lokmanik University. And uh, 12 with the 12 of these pharmacists, we took role for Konya 2021 in 50 Islamic Solidarity Games. Uh, in pharmacy service, we took responsibility and role with our 12 colleagues. You can see the pictures from this event. 
And this is the curriculum of the online course program for pharmacists. This is very detailed and expanded version of the uh, undergraduate level curriculum. And finally, finally, we uh, organized the master degree program. And this is uh, totally 18 months and uh, three semesters, 12 months for lectures, six months for graduation, graduation report. And the, for the master degree program, the IOC's drugs in sports course was selected as the main reference for the master degree, master degree program. First semester, there are some essential lectures, you can see them. And second semester, again, as essential lectures. Third semester is for the graduation project. And also uh, this program will including some elective lectures such as exercise physiology, a to Z evidence-based supplement use compounding formulas for the athletes. And uh, this is my uh, cur lectures curriculum. It was for 14 weeks. And uh, I try to present a very comprehensive lecture for our students. Now we have eight students and for the next semester, we will uh, give our first graduates from this program. And according to the, this global overview and uh, which publishes December 2022, uh, this report also including the worldwide educational programs, you can find the details. By this report, we had chance to detect some issues the current issues in sports pharmacy, as a brief summary, there are various education and training programs launched in different countries, universities or unions, and there is no accreditation for curriculum content yet. In some countries, there is a need to focus on special education programs in order to produce an emergency solution against the very easy access of drugs from pharmacies. In order to fight against doping, it is necessary to ensure that official institutions take action and implement one of the most important recommendations in FIP, right? And finally, we need to define and answer this question, who is sports pharmacist? As a suggest suggestion to answer this question, the Japan sports pharmacist model should be considered as a reference and applied for each country. For example, uh, Turkish Anti-Doping Organization and Turkish Pharmacist Association may initiate Turkish sports pharmacy movement by uh, referencing the Japan system. And, and uh, as a result, we are still enlarging our international sports pharmacy network. Last two years, we organized uh, two simple international symposium. And for this year, as Ashley mentioned, we will organize at the end of this month the third international sports pharmacy symposium. We are inviting all of you. And this uh, uh, last my last slider a uh, call to action to ensure the development of the curriculum and standardization in education. Uh, faculties of pharmacies, certified sport pharmacies, pharmaceutical associations, pharmaceutical societies, student groups, faculty uh, clubs. We have in want in Turkey uh, should collaborate first each other with each other, then collaborate with other healthcare professionals to create the most unique educational program. Thanks to everyone supporting the development and enlargement of sports pharmacy expertise. Thanks for that, Soma. Um, while you go through the Q&A section and start to pick up some of the questions uh, that were not answered. Um, let me um, pick up um, the, the we, we enter the Q&A session. Let me just pick up on maybe something that you said. Um, in the in the curriculum at the moment, um, the undergraduate curriculum, is there sufficient work being done there to allow the community pharmacists, for example, or pharmacists on the ground to actually participate and give advice on sports medicine? I'm going to open this up to maybe Mark and David that started off from an education point of view and anyone else that wants to um, kick off after that. So can I start with uh, Mark maybe? 
Thank you, Sham. Can you just quickly, just briefly recap that question? So I'm asking, is there enough in the undergraduate curriculums across the world that will give sufficient knowledge to pharmacists to actually participate in some type of sports uh, medicine, even sure. if it's at a ground level locally, yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, it really does vary from uh, from university to university. Some um, do cover sports pharmacy to some degree. Um, some it's only touched on. Um, so obviously there's a, a quite a substantial program available in Turkey. Uh, I know Ashley's also uh, involved with many in the USA. Um, so yeah, it is an emerging kind of field. Um, and I think more and more um, as we go on, more universities are actually um, incorporating this into their undergraduate program. But we're finding that a lot of pharmacists do need to go further afield and, and maybe look at some of the IOC courses, for example, um, to, to kind of further their knowledge. Um, Ashley, you might have some other thoughts there uh, on that topic. Yeah, in general, what my experience is in um, looking at pharmacy curriculums is that it's not currently <clears throat> not currently integrated into the topics um, uh, of our general core curriculum. But what I've seen are elective courses that have been developed. And so they're kind of a standalone course. And ideally what we'd wanna see is just presenting these topics in you know, bits and pieces into the core curriculum to raise awareness. And then those are, who are further interested can go on for an elective course. But um, for at least the anti-doping knowledge, uh, at least in the United States, our uh, National Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, does have a Health ProLink Advantage, which is a short educational overview course that I would encourage all athletes per personnel to take. So there are free resources out there, but I'm not seeing it incorporated into the core pharmacy curriculum at this time. May I Thank jump in there as well? Um, yeah. I, I agree with what Ashley said. Uh, ideally, I, I feel that every pharmacy course throughout the world should have a component with regard to drug use in sport, but this is just not feasible. Uh, unfortunately, there's great pressure on uh, curricula uh, within universities. Uh, but again, as Ashley said, uh, it should be offered at least as um, an optional module on, on all degree courses. Now, we haven't got the ability to influence all universities around the world to introduce um, aspects of drug use in sport within their curricula. Uh, and that is the reason that we have now uh, collaborated with the IOC and Sports Oracle to at least bring a program which is, is available to all pharmacies around the world uh, to give them an insight into what sports pharmacy is about. So it's a, a long term dream, I think, to have uh, uh, sport, uh, drugs in sport as a component of uh, undergraduate pharmacy courses, but um, it's, a, it's a long way off, I'm afraid. Thanks, David. Soma, any uh, particular questions that have come through? A theme from the question Q&A on the box? Yes, Sham, I am checking them. And uh, if you want, uh, I can direct some of the questions. For example, uh, one, of, one for Ashley. How does a clinical pharmacist in sports medicine differ from a regular pharmacist? Um, so when I say clinical pharmacy, it's um, just a distinction of working directly with the athlete. I don't think that there's necessarily um, any difference in the pharmacist or, you know, the registration process. It's just those who choose to work directly with the individual patient athletes, for instance. So um, a community pharmacist could be um, providing clinical services. A hospital pharmacist could be providing clinical services when they're uh, working more directly with a patient athlete or just athletes in the community. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, one, there is a one question, maybe Mark would answer. Are there any medications that support persons must not take before playing games other than doping? Yeah, well, we've got the obvious ones, the ones that are on the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency list of prohibited substances. Uh, they are banned by, in sport and, and athletes cannot take those uh, unless you have a therapeutic use exemption in place. But there's some other medications that um, often, come, often come up within sports pharmacy, it, you know, particularly the games or, or even in the community setting of drugs that may impact sports performance. Um, things that can cause drowsiness, benzodiazepines, antihistamines, um, things like that can actually 
uh, reduce the sports of performance. And I think uh, pharmacists need to be aware of the impact of some of the medications that they prescribe and, and to administer in terms of their uh, the negative aspects on, on, on performance. Um, of course, there's also a lot of safety issues around some of the, the drugs uh, commonly used for sports medicine. Uh, analgesic drugs include some of the opioids, which obviously have um, addictive properties. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs also, um, uh, uh, you know, do have some adverse effects uh, attached to them, which um, that all sort of forms part of the advice that a sports pharmacist would give an athlete uh, when when talking about the medicines with them. So it's not just about banned drugs; it's about the clinical use of drugs for, um, you know, for for, for other conditions um, that athletes commonly experience. May I also add to that, uh, Mark, about uh, the use of supplements by athletes. Uh, as most people are well aware, uh, anything between 65 and 95 percent of athletes use supplements, some very extensively. And of course, supplements do contain many um, products within there, many of them very potent drugs as well. So it's a, an area where pharmacists should get involved in helping and advising athletes about rational use of supplements as well as medicines. Yeah, maybe uh, as a last question, as we get to um, the end of the session, um, outside of FIP, where I'm sure we're going to create some sort of platform now where sports pharmacists that are interested can connect. Is there any other platform, um, maybe uh, clear that we can connect pharmacists where they can come and view what other people are doing and start to connect that community? Yeah, we're really lucky, actually, um, because we have Ashley Anderson here, who is the founder of the International Sports Pharmacist Network. Um, and I'm just busily um, typing a response to Robin Mullen, who asked about the timings of our symp the symposium that's going to be taking place in August. And Ashley's providing this platform as a means for pharmacists, sports pharmacists across the globe to come together to meet and discuss Another way of uh, networking is through the IOC Drugs and Sports Certificate and Diploma. And certainly um, quite a few of us here have been uh, through that program, which has opened up the doors to networking as well. You will hopefully also find that in many of the different respective countries that there will be um, specific groups within those countries as well. So our colleague Athena Cannon, she's the founder of uh, the United States Sports Pharmacist Group. So they do welcome international members, but they are fairly focused on um, uh, providing support for those in the US. I know Mark and myself have been talking to people within the UK to look to see what we can potentially put together and uh, develop within the UK. But it is an international family. So although those um, individual country groups are great, we do want to have that international basis. So hopefully that gives people a bit of a flavour of things that are out there, Sham. Thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, I cannot believe that this time has gone so quickly. Uh, we've come to the end of the session um, and we do have some concluding slides, some information to give you in the next three minutes. Um, so just to inform you that the um, digital event, next slide, the digital event will be, that's recorded, will be available um, uh, to, to, to everyone to, to, to view. Uh, the FRP Congress, uh, is in Brisbane this year, 24th to, to the 28th. And I'm aware of a sports section that's happening there with a particular, so I think the next slide might actually give you that. Yes, there's, there it is. So there is a session there that you can attend, those that are interested uh, in that. Um, and if you move on to the next slide, um, just to let you know that there's a, there's an opportunity for those that want to publish uh, to use the Pharmacy Education Journal, um, and you can get access to that via the FIP website. The next slide. So these are reference links that we've put up. So finally, just to say thank you for everyone that has attended today. Uh, my sincere thanks to each of the speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise. Um, Nilan, uh, 
uh, Mariana um, uh, and the rest that have put the project together from the digital side, uh, Ridwan who helped us on the CPS side to do the marketing, for example. Uh, and what we've learned today is that sports physicians, sports scientists and sports psychologists are well established, but our panel has shown us that there's a huge a room for pharmacists to expand and become part of uh, sports medicine. Uh, what we do need is to standardize the education across FIP and across the FIP member organizations and also formulate the necessary professional regulations around it and continue to encourage our pharmacy organizations to become advocacies for the importance um, of the pharmacists being involved going forward. Um, we, you saw the FIP uh, slide that said uh, uh, Brisbane, Australia. So we would really like to see you all there. Um, and don't forget um, that this session that has been recorded will be available at events.fip.org. Um, and if you want to give feedback to this session so that we can improve as we go along, uh, you can give us feedback on webinar at fip.org. So I'm one minute after the time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the speakers and safe journey home, everyone, for the afternoon. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye.